Democrats are poised to retake power at the State House in a matter of days now, and the man expected to wield that hefty House gavel on December 5th is longtime Concord State Rep Steve Shirtliff, our guest this morning. Steve, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Adam. So let's uh, take a little walk back here at first. Okay. Uh, you used to be a Concord police officer walking a beat. Right. Did you ever look up at that Golden Dome and think to yourself, man, someday I'm going to be Speaker of the House? Never, never. And there's a lot of times I would look up at the Dome. And I used to deliver papers and I'd, on Main Street in that area and uh, as a kid looking up at the dome and going into the State House and uh, never would have dreamed that I'd ever have an opportunity to become Speaker of the New Hampshire House. And uh, you, the vote's on December 5th. You're very likely to become Speaker. It's pretty much a formality at this point, but not quite yet. No. Uh, if you do become Speaker, uh, You'd be, we believe, the first Vietnam veteran to serve as Speaker of the House. How does that experience inform your leadership style? You know, I learned a lot in the military, and I think the most important, I think, the thing I learned was working together. When I went in the Army and when I went to Vietnam, nobody asked me if I was a Democrat or Republican, uh, just that I was willing to fight and serve my country. And um, it's hard to believe that it was 50 years ago this year that I left Vietnam, but in some respects, Vietnam has never left me. And I think back to those times and the friends I made and still have that I keep in uh, correspondence with. And uh, I think this idea that a lot of us learn in the military of working together for the common good um, plays well in the New Hampshire House. And that's something I want to see us do even more this coming session. As a representative, you've been an outspoken uh, proponent of gun control legislation. As I've been speaking to your Democratic counterparts in the Senate, they're very focused on the economic opportunity side of things. Even when I ask about guns, they try to change the subject back to that. Any surprise there? And, and do you see yourself being a strong advocate uh, for things like universal background checks, red flag legislation, and the like? Well, I never call myself a gun control advocate. I'm for gun safety. Uh, I'm a licensed tenor in New Hampshire, a former NRA member. I own firearms. I carried one in the line of duty uh, with the federal government. Um, we have a lot of great uh, people that own guns and, and handle them appropriately. But as we hear in the national news, and as has happened here in New Hampshire, we've had incidents uh, where people have used them in an improper way, and people who have had guns probably shouldn't have. So I would like to see a more of a, a background check on who's buying. Um, there are other things we need to do. We've got to make sure we keep them off of our state university uh, campuses. Uh, uh, red flag I want to look at a little bit more because a lot of parts to that uh, particular legislation. But I think people are on the right track. And I've talked to uh, Kathy Rogers, who chairs the Gun Safety uh, Caucus in the New Hampshire House. And... Um, and she's looking at things that we find from polls uh, that 80 plus percent of the populace support. So we're not for a, a strong, uh, what you hear from a lot of politicians, we want to confiscate or register or that, but it's just common sense issues that uh, will protect the citizens uh, of our state. Obviously, the veto pen of Governor Chris Sununu looms large over anything you try to pass. Uh, how do you plan to operate uh, knowing that you, you can pass whatever legislation you want as a Democratic body, but it does have to get through the governor? Well, as we saw in the past session, the governor uh, vetoed four bills and in the House, it was Republican leadership that got up and fought against those bills, uh, biomass, uh, net metering, uh, autonomous vehicles, as well as uh, d an issue dealing with parolees. And, uh, and two out of the four, the House and the Senate overturned. And I, and I think that bodes well. It shows that Democrats and, the, and Republicans are working together for the common good, as I mentioned earlier, on issues that are important to Granite Staters. And... Um, we're on the right track. And another bill I look at in that same vein is uh, family leave. Uh, we voted on that bill three separate times, and, and we were the minority party, but we, we carried the day because we had responsible Republicans join with us. And I want to see more of that in the upcoming session, and I look forward to working with the governor. Now, with your leadership style, you, know, you said during this campaign you're going to let the caucus vote uh, how it wants to vote. Uh, you're not necessarily going to try and uh, twist arms or whip people, and, which is a feature sometimes of the way things work in the legislature. How do you plan to maintain that caucus unity with Without taking that firm hand. You know, I'm, our, our caucus, uh, we Democrats in the House share the same values and want to see the same things for New Hampshire. In the last four years, we were in the minority. 
people, we stayed united, we stayed together, and it's always been my practice to tell our caucus, you vote your conscience and you vote your district, and no one will ever question your vote, and we're going to maintain that. But on the bills that are really important to all of us, and by all of us I mean the state of New Hampshire, we always come and vote the right way, whether it's to vote against the governor's school voucher bill, which would have downshifted hundreds of millions of dollars to local property taxpayers or supporting family leave. Now, the sharpest criticism you faced in that race for speaker from your opponent, uh, Representative Ernie Cushing, uh, he didn't say this directly about you, but he was like, I don't want to see Democrats be co-opted by the governor. Uh, I guess if Democrats, or particularly progressives, are looking to you to stand up to the governor, is that going to be there? If there's going to be a fight, will you fight? If there's an issue that uh, where the governor and I uh, disagree, then we will uh, fight the governor on the legislation. Uh, I look at the last four years in the House, and uh, we had Sean Jasper primarily as our speaker, and Gene Chandler, and, uh, and, and Sean and I would disagree a lot of times on a lot of things. But we could do it in a way as not to be disagreeable and keep focused on the issues that we're looking to change or what we're trying to do in the legislature. It's not personal. It's uh, an idea of all of us coming together and working for a common goal. As I pointed out to somebody recently, 80% of the bills we pass in the legislature uh, are done in a bipartisan manner. They're on the con our consent calendar, or they have little or no opposition on the floor. It's that other 20%. And a lot of the times we found that Democrats and Republicans actually want the same thing. They just wanted to go uh, to obtain it by taking a different direction. You came out very early in the race for Secretary of State for Colin Van Oster. I did. Uh, when you faced this challenge from Rennie Cushing, did he support you in turn? I didn't see anything publicly. Um, I, I don't know who Rennie voted for on the floor when that vote came up. Uh, we had the... Uh, no, but did you have Colin's backing for speaking? Oh, no, 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 not at all. I haven't, uh, I haven't really interacted with Colin at all. And, uh, and I don't want to. That's a decision for the caucus to make. Uh, I supported him, and I supported him for the same reason I think a lot of Democrats and many Republicans uh, supported Colin. We were very disappointed in some of the things that Bill had done, issues dealing with the uh, town meetings and uh, when, when, not, when, uh, when they could not be canceled and who would make those decisions, Senate Bill 3, uh, his joining the Trump uh, Commission on Elections. and. Uh, and I talked to Bill before I came out for Colin to explain, I, I like you, you'll always be my friend, but I just think it's time for a change, just as Bill thought it was time for a change 42 years ago when he defeated the incumbent uh, Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Stock. The Secretary of State in New Hampshire has to be one of the most unique jobs in American politics. You have to be able to stand up to powerful figures within your own party, in other parties, at the national level, and in 49 other states. We know uh, Colin Van Ostern has higher ambitions. He already ran for governor. So in a sense, he's going to need these powerful figures later in his career for support if he wants to run for those higher offices. What confidence do you have that he'll be able to say no to these people to whom he will be beholden for future runs for office? Oh, I, I know Colin fairly well, and uh, he's a person of integrity. And whatever he does, uh, whether it's working at... Um, Southern New Hampshire University or any other uh, job. He has always done it to the best of his ability, and he's done it in a, uh, an appropriate manner. Um, when Colin becomes Secretary of State, I know he'll bring a lot of positive changes to that office. I think that's good for New Hampshire. What he does maybe down the road in the future, while well, we've seen so many people in New Hampshire hold elective office and move on to another position, and uh, without any uh, appearance of uh, having being beholden to anybody else. And Colin has always been his own person. He'll continue to be his own person. Representative Steve Shirtliff, we thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. And uh, we'll see what happens on December 5th, but likely the next Speaker of the House. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Adam.